Now, um, it's Neil Kinnock's 80th birthday today. It seems unbelievable, doesn't it? Well, I spoke to his son, Stephen Kinnock, earlier and asked him about his dad. I'm very proud of him. Uh, and I've been proud of him for my whole life. Um, obviously, he's created vast amounts of embarrassment for me, particularly in my teenage years, uh, especially with the famous falling over on the beach scene. Um, <laughs> I thought I'd get that in, Ian, before you did. Um, but, but, you know, I'm so proud which of Which he blames on your mother, which I thought was particularly yeah. unfavorable of him. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, I think if you ask most women, it's a choice between your new suede boots or your husband going into the sea. <laughs> it's a no-brainer, really. Um, I, I, you know, I, he's... He's somebody that um, is, inspires a lot of people and has inspired me in many ways. And, of course, it's a bit strange when, you know, there's the public persona of Neil Kinnock and then there's the, the person that he is, which is your dad. And I, of course, know him in, in ways that the general public can never know him. So you, you sometimes get frustrated because people oversimplify who they think he is and, and they think they know him when they don't and certainly don't know him the way I do. But... Broadly speaking, I think what came through in that documentary is his integrity, his decency, his passion for his community and for his country. And uh, I think that the documentary captured that he feels all of those things just as strongly now as the, at the age of 80 as he did when he was a rising star in the Labour Party uh, back in the 1970s. Now, for our younger listeners, let's put, put his career in context because he became Labour leader in 1983 after the most devastating of uh, defeats. He'd been in Parliament since 1970 and was always seen as a really brilliant orator. What was the task facing him in 1983? The task facing him was to save the Labour Party from oblivion. Um, the hard left militant tendency had infiltrated the Labour Party. They were trying to uh, take it over, essentially, and I think turn it into something that would have just never have been elected. I think it probably would have been the end of the Labour Party. So his, his task was to uh, change the Labour Party from top to bottom and bottom to top. And what's extraordinary, I think, what a lot of people don't know, is how much of that was almost street to street, ward to ward, making sure the right candidates were getting selected in local council elections, in parliamentary selections. He was involved in so much of the nitty-gritty political organisation that had to happen to make sure that from the bottom up, the Labour Party was changed. And, and he fought those battles day in, day out. And I, I saw it certainly from between 1983 and 1987. Uh, the, the, you know, it was touch and go uh, on many occasions. And then he also had to do the big set piece stuff, such as, of course, his famous 1985 speech about the, the grotesque chaos of a, of a Labour council that had been taken over by militant um, handing out redundancy notices to its own people as we know well so it was a it was a in, in a sense of a battle of attrition but it, it was one in the end that he won and he laid the platform of course ultimately for the triumph of 1997. Uh, and of course, he not only was he having to spend a lot of his time trying to reform the Labour Party and make it electable again but he was up against Margaret Thatcher in her in her heyday really wasn't he? I mean how did they get on on a personal level? Because I mean, there didn't seem to be a lot of love lost across the dispatch box, which you would expect. But did, did they sort of have a late night whiskey together at all? No, my understanding is that they had no relationship whatsoever. And and actually, D Dad says that he he didn't think there was anything odd about that because he just thought that's how it was until John Major took yeah. over. And when Major took over. Um, suddenly things changed and there was a much better conversation about everything from Northern Ireland to security briefings to... And, and he always saw John Major as an honourable uh, man who genuinely could see that there was a chance that uh, my father might become the next Prime Minister and behaved in a, in a grown-up and constructive way, uh, which Margaret Thatcher never did. He nearly did become Prime Minister in 1992. It's a very narrow Tory majority. Uh, most people expected that Labour were going to win that election. I know I certainly did. Um, that must have been the most devastating of blows. How, how long did it take for him to recover from that? There was six months, I think, of a period of mourning, really, uh, which was very, very difficult for me to watch. I mean, when you're a young man and you you've always looked at your father as somebody who's a very strong 
person, a very strong character, very robust, very resilient. Mm. And, 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 and he was broken by it. Um, and not surprisingly, because he had invested so much in it and put his heart and soul into it. And of course, he blamed himself. He, he always said that there was a, an, a part of the electorate that couldn't imagine him being prime minister so he took it personally which i always argued against actually i i always said that look you know um there's all sorts of reasons why people lose general elections you can't pin it all on one factor so anyway uh it it was very very tough but i think he he bounced back from it and uh, when he went he was he was so over the moon, to use a, a football cliche, about going to Brussels and being a European commissioner because he was actually able to do something. Yeah. Uh, there was an executive role there, a, a, a commissioner for transport. I mean, and he loves planes, trains and automobiles. His office was always laden with little models of, of boats and, and planes and trains, and he's always loved that. So that, I think, in some ways was his most satisfying and rewarding period in politics. Have you thought about how, if he had become prime minister, how your life would have been different? Would you have been able to embark on the political career that you have been able to or do you think it would have stifled that or maybe made it easier i don't know it's a really interesting question ian i mean i've always felt that for me it's it's cut both ways i think some people have huge affection for dad and and i've been fortunate enough that they've conveyed some of that affection to me uh, others have have felt that it was not right that I was doing what I'm doing because of who dad is. Mm. In the end, I've always said to people, don't vote for me because I'm a Kinnock and don't vote against me because I'm a Kinnock. Take me at face value. And I think I always had that burning desire to go into politics. I'm, but I'm very pleased I didn't do it till I was 45 years old. And I'm pretty sure that I would would have had that anyway, regardless of whether or not he'd become uh, prime minister. Um, whether or not it would have been easier or harder, it's very difficult to speculate. Probably on balance, harder, because I think, uh, you know, having been the Prime Minister, he would just take on a very different uh, place mm. in our history and in our politics. But fundamentally, you know, he's... Uh, I remember when I first told him that I wanted to do it, he thought I was absolutely mad. <laughs> um, but he's definitely changed his view on that, and, and it's, you know, that which, it, which is good, because, um, you know, he's, he's also a good guy to have a chat about these things sometimes. And he was always quite an emotional man, and, and still is. I think anybody who's watched the ITV Wales documentary will, will see that, and particularly talking about your mother who's now suffering from Alzheimer's, which for those of us who've met her, and I mean, I don't pretend to know her well, but an incredibly vivacious woman. And he's now caring for her, um, as you would, I suppose, expect any husband to do. But that must be so difficult. It's, it's very hard, and it's been a real trauma for our family. And I remember when she first had the diagnosis, and we'd suspected for a while that there's something wasn't right, but the sense of shock when it was confirmed... And then the sense of shock you've felt as you've seen her condition getting worse and worse. And, and I mean, he's amazing with her. He's so caring and he does everything that he can for her. Um, but it it has taken the wind out of our sails as a family. I, I, you know, I just, I wouldn't be being truthful with you if, if I didn't say that that was the case. Um, and you, she's changed so much that you, you kind of, end up almost grieving yeah. for somebody of course who's still there because she's not really Glenis Kinnock anymore she's she's somebody else and this horrible illness has done that to her but she's still a very uh, cheerful and jolly person in many ways and a much loved mother and, and, and grandmother or nine as we say in Welsh uh, and you know we've we've had to just get used to it we're a very strong family and uh everybody's getting together tonight to celebrate his birthday so we're looking forward well, to that. as this interview is going out you'll be tucking into your first course so indeed i hope you'll wish your father a very happy birthday from everyone at lbc i will thank you very much thank Ian. you